the active outward personality of Herman Hesse. Now, last time we looked at the personality of Simone de Beauvoir, and when we did that, we noted that there were a lot of similarities in some of its chief features regarding the personality to the horoscope of Mohan Gandhi. And using that, we were able to do a comparative study in their respective approaches to power, which was a very different thing for both of them. This time we have the horoscope of another writer, Herman Hesse. And the personality or the personal elements are not highly similar to Lisa May Alcott, which was the last pure writer that we looked at, but they're not so dissimilar that we can dismiss them either. They are similar in one respect, astrologically, and uh, we'll use that as a part or a point for kicking off from. Now, in both horoscopes, the Louisa Alcott uh, Elka chart and Saturn and and the uh, Hesse, Saturn is uh, very prominent in the personality. In both horoscopes, Saturn is in a square to Mercury. In the Alcott chart, Saturn is in Virgo, the rising sign in the first house. And it was in a very strong square to Mercury in Sagittarius in the fourth house. <clears throat> Usually it's one who is always late and now it's two. Must be catching. Now, we're not going to try to say something so absurd like Saturn square Mercury means that somebody is likely to be a great writer because that's generalization that is so far stretched and comic. What we will say is that both of these two great writers experienced mental and nervous tension. We'll also go so far as to say that tension plays a large part in the life of anyone who writes. I would even go so far as to say that almost every writer faces writer's block at one time or another, especially when they have that dissertation to write. <laughs> <laughs> now, personally, myself, I'm much more of a oral person than I am a writing person. But uh, in recent years, I've gotten to do a lot of writing to support the talking. And in the last four or five years, I find that I write the equivalent of a two or three hundred page book every year. And I'm reasonably fluent, and I don't have many mental restrictions in my horoscope or in my personality. I can improvise in speech, and I can improvise in writing without deliberation. However, in spite of all of this, I face writer's block almost every day. I just shudder to think of what it was must be like to have Saturn square Mercury and have to uh, face that kind of writer's block. <laughs> That's a toughie. In my case, the uh, blockage is due to laziness. And the laziness is due to the enormous pride and egoism. Fortunately, I have you, and I am a prisoner of responsibility. 
Yeah. And being a prisoner of responsibility, I am coerced to work things out. Now, the kind of writer's block that I have is not the standard kind of writer's block, not like Louisa May Alcott or Herman Hesse. So what we're going to be doing is speaking about the aspects that most point to the afflictions. But as we're going to see later on, these same aspects can be used very positively. Now, before going any further, it has to be made clear that uh, if someone has writer's block, it does not mean that they have a personality defect or that they have a character defect of any kind. Herman Hess had a generally healthy personality. Throughout his entire character, he was healthy. And he usually didn't have really serious uh, writer's block. The most serious manifestations came, occurred in youth. I guess what we're trying to say that uh, writer's block almost has to happen. And it's unavoidable if you do much writing. And in that regard, the horoscope of Herman Hesse is almost ideal for what we're trying to get at. Which is something about Hesse, but also about blockages. His horoscope has five planets, <coughs> including the sun and moon and water signs. Everything that lives must have water. There are things that can live that don't need air, but everything that lives must have water. There's a tremendous affinity between life and water, especially between the life ether and water. Individuals who have very strong water influences in their horoscopes are drawn to living nature, sometimes as naturalists, sometimes as environmentalists, sometimes as horticulturists, or just plain gardening. Hesse was very much drawn to nature. And he loved living in secluded settings. He did not like to be out in the world at all. He loved to garden. However, this attraction <coughs> was not necessarily his relationship to the external world that is indicated by the first house. But it had something more to do with his <coughs> intimate personal surroundings. Neptune is in the fourth house, indicate a watery planet, root in the sea. It's indicative of an inward spiritual or psychological connection with water. So inwardly he was a brooding, feelingful being, and he strove all of his life for natural, spiritual, and psychological health. One of the major messages of the last, or the late, great work, Magister Ludi, or the glass bead game, the message in there was the danger of intellectually removing oneself from nature. <coughs> was leveled at the academic world of the uh, German-speaking people, basically because the Nazis, the intellectuals, didn't stand up to the Nazis. And he was telling them, you're off in an ivory tower. You're removed from uh, uh, living reality. In fact, the hero, when he realizes that, dives into the water and drowns. <laughs> Hess never knew how to finish a uh, book or a novel, and uh, <laughs> we'll come to that later on. Most of his adult life, he lived in the mountains of Switzerland. Now, certainly mountains and lofty heights 
and adventurous, inspiring ruggedness is ruled by Sagittarius rising. Though he lived there, there is nothing biographical to indicate that he had a special love for mountains as he did for living things. <coughs> he lived there for intellectual reasons. He wanted an atmosphere that was more open-minded and that allowed more intellectual freedom. From all of this we can conclude that he loved open things from the Sagittarius rising and living natural things. Writing is not a natural activity. Thinking is natural. Speaking is natural. We even have special organs for speaking. The writing is not natural. It's artificial. The letters and the words are removed even from the pictograms that they began as. And they're much further yet away from the things that those pictograms represent. So to some extent, letters and words are very removed, arbitrary symbols. In speech, one can communicate by inflection. <coughs> one can have feelingful nuance and one can stay with it until one gets across what one means. Writing is very exacting. It's awkward. People do very well. Hesse did very well with it. And it's indirect. You can argue until points are communicated, but you can never do that. You can never be sure you're even getting across to your uh, audience because writing is so terrible in that way. Some writers, including Hesse, do exceedingly well despite the unnatural limitations. But there's always a struggle between the natural and the artificial. Now, as we're going to look at it, the personality of Hermann Hesse is one example of that kind of a struggle between the artificial and the natural. He did pretty well in that struggle, and let's see how we can do as far as understanding it. This is going to be much more technical and deal with much many more minor elements of astrology than we normally do. Now there's one thing indicated by Sagittarius that was much more present in his environment than mountains. It was there from his earliest childhood when his personality was developing, and that was religion, orthodox religion. Both of his parents were pietist missionaries to India. <coughs> On his mother's side, it ran in the family. Uh, his maternal grandfather spoke 20 languages and was familiar with more of them than that. He spoke 10 languages fluently. He spoke all of the South Indian languages and translated the Bible and several other religious works into Malayalam, which is a really obscure little language. Only one uh, small province of India speaks that language. Now, pietism was an early 17th century reform movement within Lutheranism. Spencer, who was the founder of pietism, was a contemporary of Shakespeare, but I don't think they met. The stated intent of pietism was to be a religion of the heart over a religion of the head. And it didn't stress salvation. Instead, it stressed regeneration. 
and it tried to be informal. It was not uh, theologically involved in all kinds of little theological niceties. Instead, it stressed service, which is why they had these all of these uh, uh, missionaries and ministries. However, after three centuries, later, after its inception, it was probably way too formal and way too old and too rigid for Hess, who was growing up in the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, religion, like writing, is artificial. Mysticism, which is the origin and refreshment of all religions, is comparatively speaking natural. Mysticism addresses the spirit directly. Theology builds an edifice on the reports of mysticism. And what results is no longer a spiritual experience, but something second-hand or third-hand, and it's a very artificial kind of thing. Mysticism is a spiritual activity, and religion is largely social activity, because everybody has to agree that's in the society of a given congregation or a given sect or whatever. Now, Sagittarius also rules scholarly education as well as religion, and the relationship that Hermann Hesse had to scholarship was similar to the relationship that he had to religion. So we find him growing up among people who are very meek people, loving people. The atmosphere is steeped in religion and in literary things. Uh, both of his parents were avid readers of all kinds of literature, and uh, so this was, you know, theology and scholarly pursuit in literature were... Uh, in the family all the time. Now he's, Herman, is expected to follow that in uh, education, but he can't do it. He's exceedingly bright and creatively gifted. With Jupiter rising in Sagittarius, he's enthusiastic and he's unboundedly so. <coughs> he was more than a handful. He was just like too bombastic for his gentle and meek and relatively weak parents to handle. With Jupiter in Sagittarius rising, they're both positive. They're accepting. Now Jupiter's strongest aspect is the square to Venus, uh, to the moon, I'm sorry which shows him to be very excitable emotionally. But certainly he isn't closed. And he isn't unaccepting. If anything, he gets emotionally charged and gushy about uh, religious things or whatever is presented to him in his environment, especially in childhood. This sort of describes part of his relationship to religion and to scholarly activity, and it does so pretty accurately. He never disavows religion. He never becomes an atheist or anything like that. He never fights against religion and says this is all bad. And he never stops reading or studying or improving himself intellectually in philosophy or religion or any other kind of pursuit. If anything, he are pietists, the pietists, with his extreme emotionality. In scholarship, he loved Goethe because he loved the, which to me are almost overwhelming parts of Goethe, that have all of that emotional romanticism, <laughs> and he he just ate that up. 
he cannot bring, bring himself to buy into formalized religion. Or he can't bring himself to buy into formalized scholarship. Because those things are just too artificial from him. And they're too artificial and removed from what he thinks about, which is life. And life is in his feelings and in his emotions. Now he was bright enough so that he could pass all of the critical exams when the times were crucial he could pass exams and he excelled. But his parents couldn't control him and the school people couldn't control him. They had a hard time even keeping him in school because he had what was called bad behavior and he was ejected from one school after another after another. It's not described really accurately by any of the biology, uh, biographical sources that I've looked at, but it certainly was not a defiance. And it wasn't rebelliousness or fighting or anything like that. He has a positive Mars and a positive Uranus, so he's likely to be extremely rebellious like that. My guess is that it was probably comedic. <clears throat> Not exactly the class clown, but something in that direction. I, imag I can imagine him with that Jupiter rising, getting into laughing jags and having all kinds of hilarity or things like that. Now, there are other aspects of this which are going to come out as we progress, because it's very tedious tonight. <coughs> now, we've said that is not complete acceptance of either religion or scholarship was due to, not, to them not being sufficiently feelingful, but it was more than that. <coughs> the Jupiter square, the moon are only partially descriptive of his emotionality and how it plays into the personality. If it were only that, he would be something like a soapy kind of person, a gushy emotional extremist with all kinds of good intentions and excessive behavior. That doesn't describe Hess at all. As we've mentioned, he has five planets with the sun and moon and water signs. And there are many fine aspects to those planets which indicate a profoundness and a smoothness and an elegant emotional inner life. The world of feeling inwardly has more reality than the matter than the world of matter or form. As it often happens when there is a major emphasis on water signs when someone develops an inwardness, there has to be a smooth and unbroken continuity from a personality through to the spirit. And there's a lot of water. The psychology has to enter into it. The continuity has to go from the physical personality through and emotional psychology, and then into the spirit. Usually, in modern times, this means death psychology. Something like Jung, rather than something like transactional analysis, or behaviorism, or something like that. But something that one can ponder over, and brood over, and associate one's feelings with in a deep, abstract way. Of course, when he's a young lad, he doesn't know all of these things. Most of this developed for him later in life as he grew up. But whether he was young or whether he was mature, he had this enormous struggle with religion and scholarship. And he found the, the formality of them to be 
too artificial and too cramping. So what we're talking about here is a character block, not just a writer's block, but a character block. In childhood, it worked its way out through rambunctiousness, but it couldn't do that as it got older. Now, the difficulty with division in blockage is more than just his emotions not jiving with uh, orthodoxy. It has to do with something that developed very early in his life. If you look, Mercury is opposite the ascendant. So there is also a good deal of mental division that the mind is set against the environment or the personality or the external world. Mercury opposite the ascendant is a signature <coughs> You can almost count on it just by using the simplest keywords. Mercury opposite the ascendant is mental dissatisfaction with the environment. It's always indicative of dissatisfaction about the environment. And if it's in Gemini, it's even more so that way. <laughs> so it's not surprising he constantly had to change his educational environment because he vocalized his dissatisfaction. Now looking at it from an opposite perspective, it's easy to see how he himself, if you look at it not from the viewpoint of the parents, but from his viewpoint, he felt mentally disaffected because he was constantly being farmed out. It's the old term, I guess. The modern term would be outsource. His parents were outsourcing his education, and he felt he wasn't loved, and he wasn't cared for. So he was alienated from the environment. Maybe he might have even liked some of those schools if it, they hadn't represented uh, disaffection with him so that he was uh, alienated from, uh, from what his parents were putting him into. The reasons why he was mentally ill at ease with religion and scholarly pursuits and the environment and to some extent even his body and personality are different than those, than those that issue from the emotionality. They are relevant, directly relevant, and they're really worth exploring, so we're going to do a lot of uh, exploring now. Or, so if there's any planet that's opposite the environment, opposite the ascendant, that would mean dissatisfaction with the environment? Usually. I've almost always seen that to be the case. And even what's going on since the uh, uh, ascendant represents the present, the present when uh, you have something opposite the ascendant, you're, you're, you don't even like what's going on. You're, you're uncomfortable with it. You're always struggling against it. Uranus is trying to the ascendant, just as Mercury is opposite the ascendant. It's not strong, just as Mercury opposite the ascendant isn't strong. But there is sufficient strength in the Uranus trying the ascendant for it to be manifest in his childhood and in his personality. What is much stronger is the sextile of Mercury to Uranus, which is the strongest aspect in the chart. So what we're looking at here is a regenerative 30, 60, 90 triangle between Uranus, Mercury, and the Ascendant. The positive aspect usually coming, or the positive activity usually coming through Uranus is intuition. And most of the unpleasant things, the dissatisfaction, comes through Mercury. Now, these aspects seem to have acted differently at different times in his life, which is what you would expect. You see the same reality in different ways when you get older. 
In childhood, Uranus manifested as creativity, spontaneous creativity. However, in childhood and adulthood, it did not seem to manifest as creative activity about his environment. He did seem to have some intuitive sense about environment. If you look at the clouds and understand a good deal of what was going on in the atmosphere, you could expatiate about it, but uh, it wasn't primarily about the environment. The primary that way that Uranus was expressed in his childhood and in his youth was in freedom. He wanted freedom from what were the forms of orthodoxy. But he was too young to understand that in himself. <coughs> the uh, positive, spontaneous creativity is uh, mentioned in the written handout. Uh, and I tried to do something very different, something parallel but very different in the written handout, so you'll, you'll pick up from there the, the, the uh, spontaneous activities he had. As he matured into adulthood, it became the drive for intellectual freedom indicated by sextile of Mercury to Uranus that drove him away from what he considered to be the effete intelligentsia. He was quite outspoken about it. This was actually the reason why he left uh, Germany and moved to Switzerland. And from Switzerland, he became even more outspoken about it. And he even went so far as to renounce his German citizenship and take up Swiss citizenship, because he felt more free there. The mountains had a freeing effect on him, even though he wasn't especially a mountain-loving person. <coughs> and as he matured from youth, the Mercury sextile Uranus came on. And they came into effect because the mind was being born. <coughs> and because the aspect is so strong, the effects were so strong, what he was involved in was strong enough to have affected several generations. Our generations, we all read him so avidly because it was a thrill to read him. That aspect can be described very nicely in two words, key words, new thought. Was that the sextile? Of Uranus? Yes, the sextile of Uranus to Mercury indicates new thought, something fresh, something unprecedented. One other question, yes. not related. Just to refresh my understanding here, which is the intercepted sign? Sagittarius or Aquarius? Aquarius. Okay. Aquarius and Leo are intercepted. Okay. Thank you. Now in youth, even though he was quite bright and quite creative, he was not capable of knowing new thought. It was another Aquarian keyword that describes it perfectly. For him, it was a lifelong process of discovery. When we think in terms of the present as being built out of the past, we can't elucidate new things. If we could elucidate new things from the present being built out of the past, they wouldn't be new things. They would be just a continuation of the same old, same old. So, as a youth, he may not have known why exactly, but he was uncomfortable with the academic and religious environment, even though he may not have known why, because something new was being born in him. And new things are always very different from the old things. That's the nature of the old. 
And so what was being born in him was repudiating it, but he didn't know why. But even if you don't know what's being born, you can still have the sense of discomfort. You can be this uncomfortable with the things that you don't like, the things that the new is being reborn or born into. Often, the presence of what will in the future be the source of new creativity makes itself known as rebellion. But rebellion doesn't have to uh, be violent. Rebellion in the personality itself keeps the personality alive. I was fortunate to have been a uh, rebellious child and I was rebellious until I had the mystical experience. And it kept me from falling for all of culture hook, line, and sinker. Not that culture is bad, but most people accept it. And when you accept it, you go to sleep. And when you go to sleep, there is no possibility without something really extreme happening of waking up to something better. So, what is happening in him as a child is he's sensitive to novelty even though he doesn't know what it is yet. Now, if rebellion is violent or if it's too strong or if it lasts too long, it can make the possibility of creativity impossible because it sort of gets one into a luciferic self-identification or personal identification with being a full-time rebel. There are a lot of people that get into that. So it's a blessing that Hesse had the benign Jupiter in his personality that did find positive things and did accept things. And that kept him from being too overly rebellious. It's good that he had positive, beneficent parents, even though they didn't know how to uh, control him. <coughs> and even though he had to throw off the religious influence. New thought, if one is an apostle of novelty, or if one is a prophet of novelty, has to be discovered. And it has to be lived out. You can't look for, there are a lot of scientists that look through a lot of old data and they uh, try to make discoveries in it. <clears throat> they don't have the sense of discovery, they don't have the ex acceptance of something new, nor the willingness to cast aside the old form. So, since Mercury is opposite the Ascendant, it's almost as if he has to first be dissatisfied with the present, to dissociate from the present, to not be attached to the present, and when that happens, then he is open, and there is room in his character for something new to come in. Technical question. Yes. Now, since Uranus in Leo, which is intercepted, mm -hmm. uh, is vital in this 30, 60, 90. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> does the fact that Leo being intercepted make it not so fixed and make him more open to change on these things? Uh, no, it just makes it more and more subtle. His whole life is going for subtlety. The fact that Aranus is in the eighth house means that he's looking for something that is essentially hidden and invisible. Mm -hmm. And if it's intercepted, there is no toehold, and it makes it adds another layer or another degree of depth of subtlety that uh, you know I don't think he ever uh, awake to fully what he wanted to awake to. Now what happened was, is that he studied all the mystical philosophies that he could of India and China. He was very extensive about it. At one point in his adulthood, 
when he was consciously and wickedly seeking, he actually went to India. He was expecting or hoping for some kind of enlightenment experience. He was greatly disappointed. He found that the culture that had developed out of the ancient mysticism and to some extent the mysticism itself was in many respects like the religion he grew up in in the regard that a lot of it was from a dead past. And what he wanted was new life. So when you are a discoverer, you can't loop back because it doesn't work. You want something new and something old will never satisfy you. Nonetheless, getting that out of the way opened him up so that he could go on with his quest and he could create a new kind of life and a new kind of thinking. <coughs> he was enhanced by it. What he was doing was creating a new inwardness for himself. And that new inwardness included self-understanding. And that's where the depth psychology comes in. It wasn't just, he, you know, even though he would have wanted a mystical experience, that might not even have been satisfying for him. Because what he wanted was something that had understanding. And it had to be intellectually satisfactory at the same time. There had to be some kind of objectivity about it. So he never repudiated Orientalism either. He never repudiated anything. He just went on and developed new things. So for himself, he had to disengage. He couldn't hang on to those things. So he worked through the dilemmas of his life and lived them through. And that is where he brought the newness in, is through his own life. And because it was new to him as he was discovering it, it was new to us who read him. You know, it was really exciting to read him. So the regenerative triangle formed by Mercury, Uranus, and the Ascendant very nicely describes that. However, it doesn't yet get us to a complete understanding of the general self-obstruction that we're calling writer's block or personality block or something like that. So we have to do something else. We're further along than we were a few minutes ago, but uh, we still don't have an approximate picture. It's in a completeness to it. If you look at the fact sheet, if you look at the horoscope, there is another triangular pattern. There is a T-square between Mercury, Saturn, and the Ascendant. And in this case, the square of Saturn to the Ascendant is very strong, and the planetary aspect is not so strong. Thus, we can see that the resistance or negativity with the environment is strong in him. There is an outright negativity against, about, uh, against the environment. Not violent, but a, a, a negativity. Now, the microcosm, the whole character, is like the macrocosm. It's a universe. It is a one. It is a whole. Therefore, there must, of course, be some kind of conservational principle in it. <coughs> a conservation in and of the soul, you might say. As a result, if one of the many poles that are within this cosmos is stressed, the opposite also has to be activated. And it comes out in curious ways, but this one is almost a textbook example of the way it works out. When one extreme is focused, the opposite extreme is accentuated as counterpoise or something like that. Now, just a few minutes ago, we said that Uranus was active in the Ascendant and in the Concrete Mind. We also indicated that Uranus was the indicator of the newness and creativity that worked in him. 
Thus, if there is an accentuation of the new, a resistance from the old is not unexpectable. And that's exactly what we find with the Saturn P-square with the same positions, the Ascendant and Mercury. Since Saturn is always history, past, all things. So the triangle with Uranus is primarily pleasant and benefic. There is the opposition of Mercury, but it's still primarily present. And the benefic uh, that's what the, that's benefic, but the T square with Saturn is totally unpleasant and malefic. Thus, the past is not only a resistance; it's an unpleasant resistance. Something even more unpleasant than a stone in the shoe or a toothache or something like that, because it's a constant. It's a, you know, the past you can't take away; it's always with you. The weight of the past is there. And it's just on you at all times. So, we've said it a lot of times before, and we'll probably say it a lot of times again, that the ascendant indicates what we see in the external world and how we see it. So, with Saturn intensely squared, the ascendant, he's painfully aware of the drag or the inertial effect of orthodoxy from the past and that it holds over the current progress. His view of it is dark and negative. He probably, especially in youth, sees religious and educational institutions, not institutes necessarily, but institutions, as severely limiting or crystallizing now, all of the statements just made have to be tempered and modified. This, the understanding of this personality is a big study in synthesizing and weighing and balancing and keeping it all in your consciousness at the same time. So all of this is modified because Jupiter is in the first house. So he is a very complicated mixture, probably more complicated than most people. He appreciates religious sentiment, and he loves the vistas that education gives to him. But he's just aware of the cramping effect of the persistent forms from the past on the ongoing life of religious sentiment or of intellectual development or intellectual idealism. Even though it is astrologically extreme. Even this pattern is not dangerously extreme in the whole character. Would that be accentuated by Saturn also being in Pisces? Um, I wouldn't say so. No, I wouldn't say so. Now, the reason this isn't dangerously extreme in his character is because Saturn is not square to Jupiter directly, out of order. If it were, that would indicate that his sense of judgment was impaired. You can be negative or experience a lot of negativity, but it doesn't have to interfere with your judgment. It doesn't have to take that away. So he did manifest boisterous destruct disruptiveness and resistance when he was follyful in his youth, but his general sense of judgment was never taken off kilter. Now, it's obvious, it's one of the most obvious things in life, that if we are not aware of what's wrong, we can't possibly improve things. We must reiterate, make clear that negativeness is just not to be negative. In this case, it's a negativity born of the light, of a dawning awareness, of a new kind of consciousness. It must also be mentioned that this <coughs> negative consciousness 
is uh, culturally and institutionally disruptive. If there is too much of the positive and progressive and preservative Jupiter in the personality, that is a counterpoise. It soothes these disruptive and negative impulses. Mars is completely positive. Uranus is mostly so. So there's not going to be some violent change brought about by all of this. It should be mentioned that he was not a active in nor an agent of cultural, social, or institutional change. He did voice his observations, his thoughts, and his insights in popular and in academic publications, but it went no further than that. Incidentally, his more dark criticism was met with Saturnian qualities of scorn and even hatred. The institution always hates to be criticized, and it will come down with all the power that it has. And that institutionalization is Saturn. His response was primarily personal. It was a personal matter for him. Within his own personality is the way he dealt with it. Being spiritually inclined, he changed. And he grew. And he metamorphosed within his own character. He took the criticism to heart. Or he took and he could see the negativity that was in the world he could discover in himself. Many of the struggles of the new and the old are worked out in his literary works, especially the novels. The novels are studies of the latest thing that he's working on in his character, and it's not like he was trying to produce some kind of a Korean Age movement or anything like that. They weren't even meant as persuasion or propaganda or handbooks or anything like that. He was not a new thinking uh, prophet or anything like that. He had that effect to some extent. What they were more like was like journals of what he was discovering in his own uh, journey along the way. On one occasion, well, let's say it another way. At another time, we're going to try to understand more of this as it regards his mind and his mentality. But since Mercury is involved in both patterns and opposes the ascendant, we have to look a little bit more at Mercury, like it or not. Now, there are some things that are very hard to get at astrologically. It seems absurd to even try to get at some things when simple observation does it much better. In such cases, astrology serves as a guide to the observation so that you know where to look and find things more easily. And this is one of those cases. So let's ask the question all over again. Now that we've looked at two patterns involving Mercury and the Ascendant, let's ask the question, that what does it mean to have Mercury opposite the Ascendant and part of two aspect patterns such as it is? Sometimes Mercury opposite the Ascendant can mean a struggle between mind and matter. In the Western world, this is famous for being called the mind-body problem. When we observe Hess and his life and his works, that doesn't work. He was not a philosophical idealist like Fisher Barclay, who even doubted 
the reality of matter. However, if we substitute shape, uh, form, not shape, but form, for matter, then we're much more successful. So his is a struggle between mind and form. All of his life he struggled with cultural forms. We can clarify a little further and say that with Jupiter and Sagittarius rising, he didn't struggle with the purpose of forms. He was a purposeful man and he appreciated purpose. What he struggled with were the seemingly dead and restraining forms that continued on historically, whether they should have or not. <coughs> with the sextile of Mercury to Uranus, he thought in terms of freedom, especially psychological liberation. One can see that especially in youth when old things and old ways were uh, onerous to him. It was very oppressive to him. Forms are more subtle and difficult to see than matter. One can feel constrained by something like a religion or religious forms or uh, educational forms and not know precisely what one is struggling with. When one is struggling to understand and free oneself, <laughs> when one is struggling to understand and free oneself from a form, and that form is abstract, and the tool that you're using to struggle with it is concrete, Mercury is the concrete mind, it almost approaches impossibility. This is one of the big problems with Mercury having to do with things with Sagittarius or with the ninth house. Now, abstract forms have at least as much, and if you're a, a Platonist, they have more reality than concrete things. So his experience was not illusory, though his cognition of the experience may have been vague and it may not have been <coughs> easy for him to come by a more accurate way of looking at things. Saturn is concrete. Saturn is sincere. Mercury is concrete. So he did make a sincere and sustained attempt at trying to know things that were basically abstract. The attempt was straining. It was stressful. It was neurally stressful, and it was mentally stressful. Exactly what you'd expect the Saturn square, the ascendant in Saturn square Mercury. Because he loved intuitive light and the hope of the future seen in new things or even in the anticipation of new things, the past forms seem mentally dark to him. If you uh, identify something as uh, dark, you can find it in yourself. So we can see that in youth he could sense something wrong and had not yet matured enough for intuitive and creative answers, he had darkened his mind. It was not just that he could see dark things in the outer world, but that he produced and found darkness in himself. We have to remember that we're dealing with an intellectual personality, an intellectual reality, and evaluations of things in the intellect are much different than they are in somebody that's completely material. For a completely material personality, conditions of starvation or pain are terrible things. 
while the reasons for those conditions are not so bad. But if you're intellectual, the reasons for the limitations of humanity are what is appalling. We're dealing with someone here who's aware of what darkness does to a sense of purpose. Poet Borges has spoken of the unanimity of darkness. In the dark will all equal, even the presence of others might not be known. Psychological darkness is even more treacherous because, again, it's more subtle. One sometimes doesn't even know that one is in the dark, and if one does know that they're in the dark, they, not know, they might not know what to do with it. So Saturn indicates darkness and ignorance. And when it involves Mercury, it involves a mental ignorance that is very hard to see. It indicates like a blind spot in the mind. I had to deal with some Saturn-Mercury uh, horoscopes where people had criminal tendencies, and they couldn't uh, think in anything but dishonest ways. They were, they were dark to, to even being able to see that things could be done up and up on the, ele on the level. They were always looking for that little, uh, little edge that they could get by being dishonest. I've known people that would spend hours and hours working at odds on a racehorse, and if you ask them to work that hard in the office for much greater returns, they would never do it. <laughs> it's, it's something like that. You, you, don't, you don't know the darkness that you're in. So the restraining and controlling Saturnine influence was so strong in his childhood that he would shut down and he would do nothing. And it was not just a mental paralysis, because Saturn has that strong square to descend it. The mind, coupled together with the Saturnian influences, was so strong that it exercised the mind over matter thing, and he would just shut down and do nothing. And when he was coerced into trying to do something, he would get extreme headaches. Very extreme headaches. It would be almost continuous as he was in situations where he didn't like what he had to deal with, even though he may not have known what it was that he disliked about it all. So when he was very young, Jupiter was in play. As he got a little older, Saturn came into play and he would shut down. He would eventually have to be sent home for rest. Now, I'm not an expert on medical astrology, but you can look at any medical astrology textbook that you want. And you can't find anything in this horoscope that indicates headaches. Nothing that you can find that indicates headaches. It even vaguely suggests it. So it was a matter of mind over body. It was as though the head symbolically represented thinking, and it became to him literal that it pained him to think in certain ways that he didn't want to think. And so when he ran into those institutional forms he didn't like, it pained him. Now, as he got older, the way he worked with this pattern changed as he aged and matured. And this in, in itself makes for a really remarkable individual. Most people stay habitually in character, the character that they developed in the first few years of their life that they had actually created before they came back to rebirth. And they stuck in that. But he changed the way he dealt with the same pattern throughout life. What's even re more remarkable is the way that he worked with it. 
As he continued on in life, he became ever more aware of the ossification of character that comes from ossification of cultural forms. He continued to chide his fellow intellectuals, but he didn't stop there. He learned to find it in himself. His own crystallized behaviors, his own dark and fixed attitudes, anything that inhibited spiritual growth and discovery. Now mind you, this is such a neat pattern, because if there were only the T-square, you would have only that darkness. He could maybe see only that darkness if you were really, really aware. But the fact that he had the other triangle with the Uranus is he had light to see through that. He was extremely hard on himself. Some say that he was too hard on himself. <coughs> he publicly chastised himself when he didn't live up to his growing new ideals. Who caused that? This Adam? Uh, I think it's just the way he took the pattern and worked with it. The Saturn. self chastisement? Yes, that would be the Saturn. But Saturn he, square but he, Mercury? The whole, the whole T square. He, he took personal responsibility for it. He realized that when you have the light of something in yourself, you have to change and you have to be really ardent about changing. There are, yeah, I should really with Journey to the East. In Journey to the East, he calls himself out and he downs himself we're not really being uh, spiritually uh, with it. Not really trying to go spiritually. What well, is it going nice and nice and swiftly? Is it going to be done? So you feel that he's especially hard on himself, not because of, just because of T-square, but because of the the other triangle with Uranus, sextile, yes. Mercury, because he saw something yes. brighter. Yes. You could, you could say... Uh, you would put it in one sentence and say, because he loved the light, he hated darkness in himself. Now, when he does all of these things, he isn't completely harsh. This is not something somebody that is hooked on guilt or self-negation to the point that... Uh, you know, he could have shot himself down in adulthood just as he did in, in his youth. This is because he seems to have respect. And I think the Jupiter has something to do with respect, but even the Saturn has respect. There's a perfect example in the novel Demian. And in the novel Demian, there are a number of youths that are spiritually seeking together. They look into theosophy, they look into Eastern religions, and they look into all sorts of things. And the young man that is the protagonist for the story, uh, who most likely is uh, Hesse himself, makes a serious mistake. He criticizes one of the other lads, which he considers a breach of respect, because all Aspirants are supposed to respect each other and honor the way each other looks for the light. Because this young man that was criticized was looking through ancient texts, the protagonist, meaning well, criticizes him and calls him an antiquarian. And immediately has all sorts of harshness about, now this is perfectly Hess. Because it describes his own life, the, his own struggle with the past, he could objectify in the character, and he, you know, he wasn't nasty about things in the past. When he did criticize people with their fascination or continuing in the past, he even recognized that in the light of the new intuition, you know, you've got to look at the light. You may, you may have to correct those dark things, but you don't come, uh, down hard on somebody because of it. So in this, part of this is that with Saturn there's conscience. And with Saturn there's respect. And with Saturn square Mercury there's a pinpoint mental accuracy. So there is great concern 
about the past and he's very accurate in it. So in the course of his life, through the square, because the square is a building or objectifying aspect, he learns to objectify his blind spots. And they're usually residues of the past. And he works on them. And so what he basically does is he takes stumbling blocks and turns them into building blocks. <coughs> There's a sign of great, of spiritual greatness in him. Mozart took dissonances and turned them into new, rare kinds of harmony. Saturn, in its influence, almost always waxes with age. Hesse used that influence positively, even though Saturn had such negative squares. So he learned to turn mental blockages into a technique of concretely building his thoughts. The further he went on in life, the more careful, the more studied, and the more he almost used words like building blocks. And I think it took, to, to write Magister Rudy, I think it took something like between 10 and 12 years. And some of his earlier works he dashed off really quickly. He was patient, he used great care. And this is really a good example if you want to see somebody that takes what is a negative aspect and turns it into something very positive. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a perfect example. Now because Saturn has such a strong aspect of the ascendant which rules the dense physical body, it played into his health. Mercury is opposite the ascendant. And Mercury is square to Saturn, and Mercury rules the sixth house, the house of health, and that didn't help anything either. As he progressed on in age, he had many, many health difficulties. Common signs on the angles and the disposition of Saturn, Jupiter, and Mercury all indicate somebody who doesn't necessarily have a lot of stamina or follow through into the latter part of life or anything like that. I'm pretty sure that Hess was consciously aware of it, but there are some aspect patterns to Mercury and the Ascendant that uh, govern the spiritual process of his health. Emerson said, a sick man is a sinner found out. Modern mystics find that our thoughts and actions and desires that are inharmonious with the cosmos <coughs> condense into our bodies as physical conditions, as illnesses. When they are objectified in this separate material reality of our body, they stand for themselves. This is the end of the line and what you are in your physical nature is an objectification of some of your inharmonious thoughts and feelings. That reality, that objectified reality, is indubitable when there is pain. Even though we may want to, in our pride and egoism, deny it, there's no alibi. We can't rationalize. We can rationalize our attitudes and say, oh, I meant to do this, or I was intending to do that, but when you're sick, you're sick. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. The lower nature may not assent to it, but the silent spirit within, the divine being, learns and knows from experience. We may not even be consciously aware of it, because our spirit is so vast in our waking spiritual self-consciousness is so small that we may not know what we're learning from experience. And sometimes when we go through a painful, life-changing experience, we come to realize it a few years later, but we don't know it as, as it's happening to us. But the uh, facts of reality have done it. So, 
since we're all sinless, <laughs> and since our past is probably much more imperfect than we are now, we probably have a huge backlog of negative destiny. And for that reason, illness is very important to spiritual growth. It objectifies for us our most right sins that need correction. Question. Yes. How can we all be sinless and have most right sins? I didn't say we were sinless. Did I say no, I missed it. I misspoke. I'm sorry. Okay. I was just curious. Okay. No, I meant to say just the opposite. So, not only do we see our sins clearly in illnesses, but at the same time, it liquidates a lot of them. And it turns them into soul power. And we <coughs> metamorphize. Thus we become more clear, not having so much darkness. And the spirit has more power to see and work objectively. We also have more conscience as a backstop. We also have more sensitivity to others. And we have more soul power to be creative beings. And that's precisely the way it worked in the life of Herman Hess. He suffered personally, as was represented by the T-square, and he took the suffering conscientiously. He fought on it, and he worked on it. So though the awakening may be indicated more by the 30-60-90 triangle, he progressed, we couldn't have done it without the objectifying organizations uh, <coughs> or things that made things sure from the T-square. And as life went on, he became more and more even spiritually. He never gave up. So in this respect, it's a very successful life in the personality. You don't listen suffering. And all the other things that he went through in life served him very well. First by identifying problems, then taking them to heart, and then working on them. And this is the last class until uh, next March. Shakespeare will meet next week. There will be no more astrology classes until next March. And uh, give me a call then sometime. And, uh, How many more Shakespeare One more. Yes. How did he die? I don't know. The reason I asked is because of the run in the eighth house. Yeah. Whether he, whether he died uh, like uh, Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, when he died, you know what his word, the words were on his lips as he was dying? It's beautiful. When he went out of his mind. Could you say more about the 30-60-90 triangle and how that works, that pattern, 30-60-90? Um, it, what it amounts to is always two positive aspects and the negative. And it's a sextile and a trine against an opposition. Unlike a conjunction or a square, an opposition is often considered an older aspect because the two things are set apart from each other and you can see them uh, in juxtaposition as extremes. The uh, sextile part of that combination functions as reflection. It expands the experience that comes out of the back and forth and the up and downs of the opposition and passes it to the trine, and the trine then brings it to perfection or works it all in a way that it can, uh, can be spiritualized. The triangle is always associated with spirituality. The opposition is associated with mental awareness. Uh, the two rulers of the opposition in the abstract are the Mercury and the Moon, and they both are pillarizers. You learn things by seeing the sides of the issue. 
So it means intellectual awareness, yeah. expansion and reflection and then perfection. At least in this case, following along the direction of Zodiac. So kind of the difficulties and the oppositions are able to be worked out with the 3016 angle? Yeah. Yes. There are sometimes external conflicts that are not directly within the character in that the uh, line of force that goes between the sextile planets is square to the line of force that goes between the triangular planets and the planet the planetary figures that are people in your life that represent the sextile people versus the square people, they might be at odds with each other, but it is through them that there is a, a perfected quality working on. That's 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 the kind of astrology that's very, very subtle and way beyond what we're trying to do. Yeah, well I quit the trust me to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. That's <laughs> <laughs>